He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in a, another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to a college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He never did none of those things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. Another betrayed him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through a mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed tomb through the pity of a friend. Many centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All of the armies that have ever marched, all of the navies that have ever sailed, all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. Dear friends, this poem was written by a man many years ago describing his thoughts on Jesus. You know, many, many songs have been sung. Many things have been written about Jesus. Many discussions have been held. Dear friends, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the very center of the Gospel. This morning, let's look into the Bible. Let's study about Jesus. Let's study about the Gospel. The Gospel is the good news, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there in the very first four verses, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Towards the end of our lesson, we will be coming back to, to this Scripture. For the next few moments, I'd like to focus on the death that took place of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus if you would, let's notice Matthew chapter 27 this morning. Matthew chapter 27. There in verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, When the morning was come, all of the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put Him to death. And when they had bound Him, they led Him away and delivered Him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. We go to verse 11. The Bible says, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? 
And he answered him to never a word, and so much that the governor marveled greatly. So we see here that, that Jesus stood before the governor. He is standing before Pontius Pilate. Now, it, it was the custom for the governor at this time during the feast to release a prisoner to the people. To release a prisoner that, that the people requested. And so as we go on, we notice there in verses 15 to 26 that when Pilate asked the people who he should release, the crowd chanted for him to release Barabbas. They wanted Barabbas to be released. But dear friends, we see according to Mark chapter 15 and verse 7 that, that Barabbas was, he was a murderer. Dear friends, Pilate knew that Jesus was not guilty. Pilate knew that, that Jesus had done nothing wrong. He knew that he had never done nothing against the law. But we read in Mark chapter 15 and verse 15 that Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus to be crucified. Pilate wanted to, to content the people. He was, he was more concerned about keeping the crowd happy than he was about doing what he was supposed to be doing by doing the right thing. He gave in to the crowd and released Barabbas just as the crowd had requested. Brethren, oftentimes today, preachers may be guilty of preaching to please the crowd instead of preaching to the whole counsel of God and preaching to be pleasing to God. Dear friends, I'm very thankful this morning for our elders here who make sure we have men preaching in this pulpit who are not afraid to stand up for the Word, who will preach the whole counsel of God and, and not seek after the men who, who, who seek to please men, but rather those who stand firmly on the Word of God. Dear friends, I pray that I am never one who compromises the Word of God. I pray that I am never one who, who gives in and who tries to be popular with the world. But rather, I pray that I am one who stands and preaches only what the Bible says. Only what the Word of God says. Now, getting back to our main text, we go to verse 27. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 27. The Bible says there, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Now we're about to go in and we're about to see what all Jesus went through. We're going to see what all Christ endured for you and for me. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. We skip down to verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. Can you imagine this going on right now? They're saying... Verse 40, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. 
Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he did say, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Dear friends, Jesus Christ suffered for you and for me. He went through so much pain, so much suffering, and so much agony on that cross for you and for me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Dear friends, we see from Scripture just how much Jesus endured. We see just how much the pain and the suffering that He went through. The Bible says He was whipped. He was beaten. They stripped Him of His clothes. They put a crown of thorns on His head. He was mocked. He was spit upon. He was hit. He was crucified. But dear friends, yet He stayed on that cross. He endured all of that and He stayed on that cross for you and for me. Let's talk about, for the next few moments, His tomb. In Matthew chapter 27, Starting in verse 57, the Bible says, When the evening was come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and it was laid and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. So, we see that Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. We go on down and we read in verses 63 to 66 that that the tomb was sealed and it was guarded until the third day. And, And we see that the chief priest and And the Pharisees, they worried that the disciples might steal the body of Jesus. They was afraid that they was going to steal it. Now I want you to imagine this scene. Jesus has suffered this cruel death. And He has been laid in a borrowed tomb. Dear friends, if, if that was the end of the story, how sad would that be? If, if he had stayed in that, in that borrowed tomb, how sad would that be? But brethren, the good news this morning is we know that's not the end. We know that Jesus didn't stay in that tomb. And so for the next few moments, let's, let's look on the resurrection of Christ. All four of the Gospel writers tell of this same account. We read that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joanna came to the tomb early in the morning to bring the spices to anoint 
the body of Jesus. And so, what is it that they saw when they got there? When we're reading these accounts, we see that, that they found the stone rolled away, number one. And so we go to Mark chapter 16 and verse 3, and, and we see that the women, they were worried about how they were going to move the stone. But we go to verse 4, and we see, verse 4 of that same chapter, and we see that, that when they had got there, the stone had already been rolled away. The stone wasn't, wasn't still sealed there. We learn in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 2 that, that there was a great earthquake for the angel had, had come from heaven and he rolled that stone away. I read that H. Leo Bowles, that he often said, the stone was rolled back not so the Lord could get out but so the disciples could get in and see that the Master was gone. Dear friends, Christ could have come out of that tomb even if the stone had stayed there. He could have just as easily been resurrected from the dead if that stone would not have moved. And so they found the stone rolled away, number one. Secondly, they found the angel who told them that Jesus was not there. Christ had risen from the dead. And so we see that the angels knew who the women were looking for. And the women, we see, were told to, to not be afraid, but to come and see where Jesus had lain. We see that in Matthew 28 and verse 6. And so thirdly, we see that they, the, the women and the disciples, they found the grave clothes still in the tomb. Luke chapter 24 and verse 12 and John chapter 20 and verse 5. And so when they got there, they found the stone rolled away. They found the angels who told them that Jesus was not there. They found the grave clothes still in the tomb. So what was it that they didn't find? What did they not find there? It was Jesus. Jesus was not there. He, he, in fact, was risen on that third day, just as been prophesied in the Old Testament. And just as Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, and in John chapter 2 and verse 19. Dear friends, the gospel is complete. We see that Jesus died. He suffered that cruel death. He was buried in a borrowed tomb but He was raised on that third day. And so let's talk about the Gospel. Paul, in fact, writes about the Gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We see here that, that he is writing to the church at Corinth, and in this chapter he, he is addressing the resurrection of Christ. We see there in the first 11 verses that, that Paul gives us facts about the resurrection, while in verses 12 through 19, he, he explains the importance of it. And so we go back to 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Dear friends, all of this had already been prophesied in the Old Testament. And so we go to verse 12. We see that Paul explains, Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are all found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, 
whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And so we see here that Paul shows us that if Christ is not raised from the dead, if He is not risen, then our faith is in vain. Dear friends, if without the resurrection we have no forgiveness of sins, without the resurrection of Christ we have no salvation, we have no Christianity, we have no hope for eternal life without the resurrection. But thanks be to God this morning, dear friends, that Jesus Christ did rise on that third day. And so, what does that mean for us today? What does the resurrection mean for us today? Dear friends, the resurrection shows that sin was atoned for. It shows that death was conquered and that eternal life is now available to all who obey and live faithfully. All of this is possible because Jesus lives. Because Jesus lives, our faith is not in vain. Because Jesus lives, we have hope beyond this life. Because Jesus lives, we will be raised if we are in the grave when He returns. Because Jesus Christ lives, death and the grave are conquered. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26, the Bible says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Verse 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is is the law. Dear friends, because Jesus lives, we have the victory through Him if we are obedient and if we live faithful. Because Jesus lives, our labor is not in vain if we are a Christian. Therefore, my beloved brethren, verse 58, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Dear friends, when the women went to the tomb of Jesus after He was crucified, they heard three things. Three things were told to them. They heard, Fear not, come and see, Go and tell. And we see, dear friends, that's exactly what they did. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 8, the Bible says, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring His disciples' word. Dear friends, this morning, if you're not a Christian, we ask that you put any fears that you have aside. We ask that you come and see what the Word of God says about the salvation of your soul. After hearing the Word of God, you must believe it. You must then be willing to repent of your sins, turn away from your sins, and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You must be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, dying to your sins and having them washed away and be raised out of that watery grave and to walk in the newness of life. Dear friends, Christ suffered 
He died on that cross for you and for me. But we know that that was not the end. He was raised on the third day, and He sits today on the right hand of the Father. Thanks be to God for His unspeakable gift. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. This morning, dear friends, don't be afraid. Come and see. And then go share the Word of God to a lost and to a dying world. Will you come as together we stand and as we sing? Thank you.